G'day, brothers G'day. and sisters. This is the other Paul, and I'm here for a long planned special stream with my fellow Anglican friend, Sean Luke of Anglican Aesthetics. Sean, how are you going today? Hi, Paul. It's good to be with you, and thanks for having me on. Excellent. Not a problem, man. Super glad to have you. And yes, this one's been planned for a while. It's been, it's been like we had this idea for like that going back months or something, yep. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think um, time just opened up. I just finished up with seminary officially, um, nice. officially coursework. So, uh, yeah, time's just opened up for me to do more stuff like this, which is really great. Excellent, excellent. Congrats on that. And so now we can actually move to a very important topic with respect to Anglican and Romanist discussions uh, on ecclesiology. And that being on the papal bull, late 19th century papal bull, Apostolicae Curae. And to summarize it for uh, for people who don't know about it, it was a papal bull issued at that time that essentially declared that Anglican holy orders, so the diaconate, priesthood, and episcopate, that these were invalid due to cert, uh, certain changes made to various things in the Reformation period. Um, and therefore, um, the Roman church wouldn't treat us, as, as a result, the Roman would, church wouldn't treat us as a simply broken off yet apostolic successionally valid church to put it very briefly, um, which of course is very big, big ramifications. If one is of that ecclesiological view, which puts a high premium on valid ordination and apostolic succession as the Anglican tradition does and has historically. So this will be an Anglican response to apostolic curia, whether its arguments actually do pan out or if they kind of drop the ball on this one, as they have in many other areas. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and to add one thing to that, um, part of the reason this matters for uh, ecumenical dialogue, both in terms of Anglican apologetics and defense of our orders, but also uh, as a response, is because the invalidity of Anglican orders was declared ex cathedra. We'll go into why we have time and how we know that, um, yeah, but that's not a controversial opinion. You know, Cardinal Avery Dulles's book list says as much. So does Francis Sullivan's book on the Magisterium. Um, so if Rome is wrong here, that actually is itself an argument against magisterial infallibility. Yeah, yeah, a decisive argument at that, given that this is core and part and parcel of Roman ecclesiology. Um, and so before we begin, I will open us up with the, because I think I did it with you last time, with my good old uh, Collect for Historians that I've written, because yeah. this is... An historical issue and so we do want the lord's guidance in ensuring that we are accurate and we don't mislead people and so allow me to lead us in this prayer all right excellent all right the lord be with you and also with you let us pray almighty god who knowest and decreest all things lead us this day in these our inquiries of times past grant merciful father that we assert not fact where there is none nor praise where it is unmerited nor judgment where it is undeserved, but that the fruits of our study be only the story which thou hast written before the foundations of the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Spirit be the honour and the glory both now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. All right. So let us commence. Um, Luke, give us, uh, to begin with, give us some historical background to Apostolic A. Curie. Yeah. What's going on? Why did it come about? Yeah. So during the 19th century uh, in England, you had a movement that some of our viewers, I'm sure some of your viewers will be familiar with, called the Tractarian Movement. And it was sort of a attempt to frame Anglicanism as one of the great three streams of uh, apostolic Christianity. Uh, so you have the Roman Catholic Church, which has uh, maintained apostolic succession. You have the East. And the argument was that you also have apostolic succession maintained mm -hmm. in the Church of England. And so the Tractarians, uh, among them, a famous one, uh, John Henry Newman, who eventually did become a Roman Catholic and a, a canonized Roman Catholic at that, wrote the famous Development of Doctrine book. Um, he tried to argue at first that the Anglican Church was a, a great, a church of the great tradition. And they appealed to Rome to accept their holy orders, just as Rome accepts the East holy orders as a way of trying to get dialogue going, trying to approach something of unity. Now, Rome did that. They were happy to take up that request. Um, and so in 1896, they met, I believe, from March to May, uh, about 12 or 13 times. I think it was 12 times. Uh, and over the course of those two months, they researched the issue. They 
scoured the Vatican archives. Um, and we'll get into sort of why, I, I don't think it's fair to call it a decision of that commission per se, um, but the result of that commission was uh, the ex cathedra declaration from the Pope uh, that our orders were invalid. And therefore, Anglicans don't have a valid Eucharist as we consecrate the Eucharist. We'll get into, again, what all of those terms mean, but that's sort of the background that uh, we don't have a valid priesthood as the Eastern Orthodox Church, even though they're not in communion with Rome, would have a valid priesthood. And that's significant because that would mean if an Anglican priest were to become a Roman Catholic, as happens, and vice versa, but especially uh, as Anglicans become Roman Catholic priests uh, or bishops, they must be reordained. Okay, thank thank you for that background. Actually, as a brief aside, because I, I noticed that when I read the document itself, it talked about a whole commission where they had different participants mm -hmm. and they gave their own opinions and such. Is there anywhere that preserves documentation from that commission, or is Apostolic yes. Curia like it? Yeah, there is. You you kind of have to scour for it, and it's in academic journals. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll, I've pulled some quotes from it. We can link some sources later in the comment section. <clears throat> Yeah, um, okay, yeah. But yes, it is there. Um, you just have to dig around for it quite a lot. Okay, very interesting. I'd be very interested to see that. Um, so yes, I reckon. Um, hang on, let me check the exactly what I said. No, my mouse is going absolutely bonkers right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, okay. So we've got the background, and now we're going to move on to the actual meat of the stream. Would you like me to pull up the letter, uh, the ball itself? Please do. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Let me share screen. The knowledge of Anglican orders. Here we go. So let us commence, Luke. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So Apostolic Kukurai proceeds on several key arguments. So uh, a, a little bit more historical background during the Reformation. Thomas Kramer, he was constituted actually as a bishop and an archbishop as the Church of England was even still in communion with Rome but it was yeah. breaking off from uh, breaking off from Rome. So he's considered right. a valid archbishop, at least insofar as he received his orders. Now, when uh, Henry VIII, you know, did, and just as a brief response to people who, I've had plenty of, of people come to my comment section and say, oh, your church was started by lust. Um, you know, as Henry VIII, he did break off communion with uh, Rome and for poor motives, his, he was motivated by lust and depravity conceding that but he didn't henry the eighth's goal even was not to start a new church de novo and that was not the goal of any of the anglican divines of the 16th century <laughs> what happened was henry the eighth sent out a delegation and they brought back reformational theology into england and the archbishop of canterbury thomas cranmer along with several other clergy many other clergy in fact found themselves convinced of reformational theology uh, so they actually started arguing for a reformational Catholic church. So they maintain the ecclesial structure of bishop, priest, and deacon. It's not that they just abolished Rome and then started this thing called Anglicanism. Yeah, and uh, now we run by altar calls on Sunday services. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, my priest likes to say we have an altar call every Sunday, the Eucharist. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we maintain that as something that was part of the form of the Mass. Uh, and we, we did that intentionally. Now, under uh, Edward, King Henry's son, Edward was a Protestant. He was actually pretty young, too, which is interesting. Uh, but he was a fervent Protestant. And Thomas Cranmer, as he was undergoing his own theological development, uh, he came to more reformed stances on things. And so he updated the ordinal. And that's where this controversy begins. Because underneath that ordinal, priests and bishops were constituted underneath new premises. Now, the, the claim of the bull is that the ordinal uh, shifts from Rome's intention to ordain priests, and it corrupts the form of order. So what does that mean? That, what does that mean? Well, in the Roman Catholic Church at, at the time, when priests were ordained as priests, they were ordained for, quote, the work of a priest to offer up the uh, mass as a sacrifice. Now, underneath the Edward ordinal, the Edwardine ordinal, uh, priests were ordained to receive the Holy Spirit and uh, exercise the office of the key. So forgive sins as Christ has given uh, the presbyters, the priests, authority to do so, to bind and loose sins. And to minister rightly uh, 
the that which Christ has given the church uh, to do them to minister the sacraments to minister the word. Uh, that that was sort of the idea behind the Edwardine ordinal. Now later under Elizabeth that gets updated uh, the words and actually towards the end of Thomas Cranmer's life that also gets updated in terms of offering up the Eucharist as a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. But that wasn't a controversial uh, it wasn't a controversial addition. Okay, so given all of that background, Apostola Kokura wants to argue, and we're going to stick to the theological arguments because the historical sure. questions, while they're interesting, there, there are several historical issues raised in Apostola Kokura and we'll find in Sibia Sophikios, which is the Anglican's yeah. response to Apostola yeah. Kokura, relating to some of the historical issues, whether uh, historically certain orders after Cranmer were accepted by Rome or not. Those are yeah. interesting, but we're going to stick to the theological well, issue because, at least to my mind, that's more important. Yeah. And um, and if you need me to move to any specific parts of the document, just just tell me where. Yeah, great. Um, the document is going to be super small on my screen because I have my notes pulled up on my other side. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, this um, means this, I've actually zoomed it up heaps because it's actually much smaller on the web page. <laughs> hey, hey, yeah. And so feel free to pull to whatever parts of the document you, you find relevant as well, Paul. Sure. Um, so Apostolica Cori makes several key arguments. First, given that Anglican orders changed the form of the words to... Uh, receive the Holy Ghost for uh, uh, and you know for the authority to bind and loose sins to minister the words and sacraments. Rome makes the argument that this is by no means part of the work of a priest. Right? We all receive the Holy Spirit, and uh, so it can't be distinctive to the priesthood. So the claim goes. Now the second thing that's sort of uh, becomes more decisive, at least in later dialogue, is that. The claim is that Anglican priests, they're not ordained to uh, sacrifice the mass, offer up the mass as an oblation, as a sacrifice. Now, the way Catholic theologians both at the time and today substantiate that is by picking up on the rhetoric where Cranmer will talk against uh, the mass as a sacrifice. We'll address that in a little bit. Uh, and you'll have other Anglican divines and other reformers talking against the mass as a sacrifice. And so the claim then is that if the reformers were talking against the mass as a sacrifice, Anglican orders could never be valid. Priests were never being ordained to offer up the mass as a sacrifice. And therefore, uh, Anglican, the Anglican church is not intending to do what the church does. So that's sort of the key line for the validity of sacraments. Rome, for instance, will count Baptist baptism as valid uh, because, at least as they claim, at least Baptists are intending to do what the church does. But the claim is that Anglicans are not intending to do what the church does uh, when we ordain priests because we don't ordain them to offer up the mass as a sacrifice. That's the key issue we're going to focus on. Uh, at least I'm going to focus on today. Paul, if you want to add anything to that, go ahead. Whoops. That was a accidental thing. Um, I noticed my stream actually came up on the result there, huh? Um, but uh, yeah, not much of a result there. It, uh, not much to say so far, except for how um, there is, it does show a big issue of restrictive language with respect to sacrifice. Like even in our um, modern language today, even in you know, evangelical and reform circles, uh, because of the layers and layers of these discussions we've had, um, it's very, it's pretty much it's very often we'll have a one-for-one -one correlation between the term sacrifice and a, uh, and like an atoning propitiatory type mm -hmm. of sacrifice when that's even in other parts of our language, we know that's not the case. Like we can speak of sacrificing our time or money, for example, among, among other things. Um, yeah. And so I think this is going to touch on a, a key problem of the loss of language of historic uh, biblical and historic patristic language of other kinds of sacrifice, like, thanksgiving which is where the very term eucharist comes from yeah. so that's that's what i have so far yep and that's important because the anglican part of the reason that phrase gets added back in even in Kramer's lifetime is to avoid confusion what we'll find uh is that it's not the case that anglicans deny and that the eucharist is a sacrifice in any sense uh, we'll see that very quickly uh but uh, they deny that it's a sense in the Romish sense, and you'll find that language in the article, uh, that in the Roman Catholic sense of the term sacrifice, that's the sense in which we're going to deny 
that the mass is a sacrifice. Right. Uh, yeah. So I, that's that's sort of an outline of the argument. So we're going to examine that argument, put it okay. to, to see, okay, what did the Anglican divines and the Anglican church intend to do when they ordained priests as priests? And did that match the early church? And the reason we're going to do that is because if it matched what the early church did, uh, then Rome, by this argument, is actually undercutting their own orders, right? So if they've ordained people in a line of succession where former priests were ordained using the language and the intentions that Anglicans had, then Rome has to declare their own ballot orders null and void. And of course, they can't do that. <laughs> um, so if we find that our doctrine reflects the doctrine of the early church, um, we'll find that Rome has undercut its own argument. Now, Paul, if you want to go to the very end of the document very quick. Yes. Um, here's how we know that this is an ex cathedra statement. There's a formula used at the end there, or close to the end. We define, we decree, we declare uh, that all Anglican orders are null and void. I think it's like in the last or second to last paragraph there. Um, we def we define no declare. Um, I think it's, it's, that's that's the famous one, null and utterly void. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it's, yeah. Is that the one? I think so. Does that use define declare? Uh, <laughs> no. Hang on. Hang on. Um, null and void. Let me go. Wherefore, strictly, um, okay, yeah, I think it's this one. <clears throat> Wherefore, strictly adhering in this matter to the decrees of the pontiffs, our predecessors, and confirming them most fully, and as it were, renewing them by our authority and of our own initiative and certain knowledge, we pronounce and declare that ordinations carried out according to the Anglican rite have been and are absolutely null and utterly yeah. void. So here's why that's an ex cathedra statement. For Vatican I, you'll, you'll often hear, you won't hear this from people like Trent Horan or Michael Lofton because they, they are nuanced, um, but you will hear that uh, Rome, that uh, from some popular level Roman Catholics, it's only exercised uh, papal infallibility twice. Not true. Most Roman Catholics don't think that's true. Um, look at Francis Sullivan's work again on uh, on the magisterium, even Michael Lofton has some good work on the. Uh, he has a lot of good work on the magisterium, I think. Mm. Uh, and I think it's important to look at that. The reason we know this is an ex cathedra statement is because it meets the conditions highlighted at the end of Vatican I uh, when it defines papal infallibility. It defines the conditions under which the Pope speaks infallibly, especially in using that formula. And when the Pope is acting in his role as the pastor for the church, Catholic, and uh, decreeing that which is true throughout the church, that's when pa uh, uh, papal infallibility applies. So uh, we're going to find then that this is an instance of the exercise of papal infallibility. So if it's wrong, that falsifies the notion of papal infallibility and thereby falsifies magisterial claims. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so this one really is, it's not just another another of the countless theological disputes we can have with Rome, where eventually, um, if things really get to a head, we've all given the evidence, eventually one side can just say, well, the the uh, the Holy Church itself has spoken, so even if you give all these arguments, it's not going to change my mind. Um, but this is actually an issue, one of those few special issues that threatens that very premise. And so yeah. this actually has gone from just a simple, uh, a simple squabble between the English bishops and Rome to something that's actually quite existential for Rome. So very interesting. Yeah, great. Okay, so I'm, I'm good to, to proceed to the Anglican doctrine of the Eucharist at the time of the Reformation. Do you have anything you want to touch on, Paul? Um, not particularly right now. Do you want me to bring up any documents on that or? Yeah, um, maybe the article. I, I think um, the, the, from the 39 articles on the Eucharist, that'll be good to, to just have as a reference. Uh, yeah, as too should. easy. All right, great. Um, on the on the Lord's Supper, one second. Da, 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 da. Okay, here we go. So, Article Twenty Eight. I shall zoom in on that, and I'll share the screen first. Okay, there we go. So, Article. 
28 of the Lord's Supper. One sec. Yeah, go ahead and read that. And we'll see why it creates some uh, tension between Rome and um, the English church in a minute. So okay, perfect. Um, so it says, Article 28 of the 39 Articles, the Supper of the Lord is not only a sign of the love that Christians ought to have among themselves one to another, but rather it is a sacrament of our redemption by Christ's death insomuch that to such as rightly, worthily, and with faith receive the same, the bread which we break is a partaking of the body of Christ, and likewise the cup of blessing is a partaking of the blood of Christ. Transubstantiation, or the change of the substance of bread and wine, in the supper of the Lord cannot be proved by holy writ, but is repugnant to the plain words of Scripture, overthroweth the nature of a sacrament, and hath given occasion to many superstitions. The body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only after an heavenly and spiritual manner. And mean and the mean whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not by Christ's ordinance reserved, carried about, lifted up, or worshipped. Yeah, great. Now, the reason that creates um, tension is because the impression is that uh, Anglicans are coming out sort of uh, swinging against the Roman notion, and in some ways it is. <laughs> uh, it's condemning the notion of transubstantiation. Um, but note what the order, what that article doesn't do. It actually doesn't say the Eucharist is not a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Now, it does condemn the Roman Catholic understanding of that, and we'll find the Anglican di uh, divines doing that. Um, but the Lutherans actually also held that the Mass is a sacrifice in a sense, uh, and we're going to find out what that sense is. So okay. Tom Kramer, uh, he wrote a book on the Eucharist, um, and I'm pulling it up here here uh, in from my notes. So it was in part, it, it was a book called The Sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and it also contains a reply to a bishop that he was in uh, dialogue with, and he was a sort of sort of butting heads with at the time. And he writes the following. Um, so and this is, I think, a, a huge piece of evidence that the Eucharist is understood to be a sacrifice, but just not a propitiatory sacrifice. So mm. uh, quoting, and as touching the second place of St. Augustine, so the second place Cranmer is quoting Augustine, he saith not that the body and blood of Christ be really in the sacrament. So the idea there is that somehow uh, the physical body and blood are sort of physically permeating the sacrament, um, not the, or that the elements have been transubstantiated. Uh, he sa says not that the body and blood of Christ be really in the sacrament, but that in the sacrifice of the church, that is to say the holy administration of the Lord's Supper, is both the sacrament and the thing signified by the sacrament, the sacrament being the bread and the wine, and the thing signified and exhibited being the body and blood of Christ. But St. Augustine says not that the thing signified is in the bread and wine to whom it is not exhibited, nor is it not in it, but as in a figure, but that it is there in the true ministration of the sacrament, present to the spirit and faith of true believing man, and exhibited truly, indeed, uh, and yet spiritually, not corporally. Okay, so what's going on there? First, Cramer is denying that when we consume the elements, uh, we are consuming that which is actually the substance of the physical body and blood of Christ. The Roman doctrine of transubstantiation wants to say that the body and blood of Christ are given under the accidents, the appearances of bread and wine. So it smells like a duck. It, uh, it looks like a duck. It, it sort of walks and talks like a duck, but it's actually the body and blood of Jesus. Um, it's, it's, it resembles bread and wine in every way, uh, but it's, it's not bread and wine in its substance. It takes on the appearances of those things. Now, um, a, Cranmer is pointing out that's, that's, not, that's not in the patristic sources. It's not in Augustine. Now, we do affirm, as Anglicans, as Cranmer writes in this treatise, that Christ is present in the elements on the altar. He's actually spiritually present in and through those things. But what we're denying is that he's that the elements are transubstantiated into his body and blood. Now, Cranmer also will write uh, that the, uh, the Eucharist is a kind of sacrifice. So, for instance, he's going to quote Augustine, uh, where Augustine talks about our works actually being offered up as a sacrifice. Um, and he talks in that context about the Eucharist being offered up as a sacrifice, which makes the church as a whole a living sacrifice offered up to God. 
Kramer points out that's not talking about a propitiatory sacrifice. So we affirm that the Eucharist is a sacrifice in that sense, in the sense that the priest offers it up as something pleasing to God, and it makes the body of Christ, the church, uh, into something that's pleasing to God through nourishing us spiritually by the body and blood of Christ. Now, Kramer does interestingly say we really do feast on the body and blood of Christ, but we do so by faith. We're feasting on the body and blood of Christ by faith and through receiving his body and blood by faith. We're being nourished and conformed and receiving the forgiveness of sins. So there's actually an incorporation of the Lutheran idea of ongoing justification, not progressive, ongoing justification and ongoing forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. We really receive the forgiveness of sins. And we really are being built up into the body of Christ through the Eucharist. That's certainly there in the patristic sources. But Kramer points out this idea of it being a propitiatory sacrifice is not there in Augustine. And he's also going to point out that it's not there in a number of other people. Now, okay. yeah. yeah, go for it, Paul. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, I was just remarking. Wow. Okay. Yeah, interesting. So is this, August, is this Augustine of Hippo or Augustine of Canterbury? <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> that's what I'm saying, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and particularly in the city of God uh, is is one of the the uh, key quotations that he mm. goes back to again and again. Now, um, here's I want to uh, just quote the text of the Edwardine Ordinal and then uh, quote sort of William Perkins. He was an, a moderate, considered a moderate Puritan. Uh, he's an Anglican theologian of around the time of the Reformation. He was not a separatist, though. So. Okay. The mainline Puritans, if you think about them, like John Owen or uh, some of these other English Puritans, they advocated for either separating from the church or essentially making the Church of England Presbyterian. And the Anglican divines would push back on that. So there was a controversy between um, Anglicans and Presbyterians uh, in, in the Church of England. Now Perkins, he wasn't. He agreed with some of the critiques of the Puritans, um, like namely of some high church tendencies. And whatever you think about those critiques, uh, he nevertheless advocated for maintaining the historic form of the church and simply purifying those forms rather than adopting a presbyterial church governance. Mm. Now um, the form of the Edwardine Ordinal says this. Uh, so when a priest is ordained, uh, it was said. Receive the Holy Ghost, whose sins thou does forgive, they are forgiven, and whose sins thou does retain, they are retained. And be thou a faithful dispenser of the word of God and of his holy sacraments. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So there were several things there, right? So when a priest is ordained, they receive the Holy Spirit, particularly for the work of a priest, right? So one of the things the Anglicans respond to Rome is that they're not they're they're obviously not saying in that ordination right uh that a priest is just generically receiving the holy spirit like what that's just very clear yeah. it should be obvious that that wasn't what they're saying um but rather it's relative to the office that they're being ordained in which is why then the words become more explicit as the ordinal gets edited over time so receive the holy ghost whose sins thou does forgive so this is the language of the office of the keys that the priest has authority to pronounce absolution uh, over the penitent person and it commissions the priest to be a faithful dispenser of the word of god to teach the word of god in authority and truly and to minister the sacraments mm -hmm. those sacraments are baptism in the eucharist right there are, there's those are the sacraments of the gospel now anglican theology has two sacraments of the gospel five of the church so we we actually do historically have retained seven sacraments but we divvy them up yeah to say that two are necessary, normally at least necessary to salvation, the other ones are not, um, which is why they're sacraments of the gospel versus sacraments of the church. Now, here's Perkins. So Perkins wrote a book called The Reformed Catholic, and he's specifying the sense in which we're, we're actually in agreement that the Eucharist is a sacrifice. So again, this is pretty early on. This is, uh, I believe Perkins is writing in the 1600s, I think. So I think he's part of the second generation there. Um, so it's still pretty early on. And here's what Perkins uh, says, that the Lord, so this is how we agree with Rome, that the, the supper of the Lord is a sacrifice and may be truly called as it has been in former ages, and that in three respects. First, because it is a memorial of the real sacrifice of Christ upon the cross and contains in addition a thanksgiving to God for the same, which thanksgiving is a sacrifice 
and calves of our lips, the, the idea there being the fruit of our lips. It's an older way of saying that. Two, because every communicant that does there present himself, the body and soul, uh, body and soul, a living, holy, and acceptable sacrifice unto God. For as in this sacrament, God gives unto us Christ with his benefits. So we answerable, give up ourselves unto God as servants to walk in the practice of all dutiful obedience. So this is coming straight from Augustine, actually. This notion that when the Eucharist is given, it actually facilitates the ecclesial body into a living sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving uh, up, offered up to God through our very lives. And that language is Romans 12 too. So the third sense in which we agree with Rome is that it is called a sacrifice in respect of that which was joined with the sacrament, namely alms given to the poor as a testimony of our thanksgiving unto God. So often donations would be collected, and actually my, our church still does this, many Anglican churches still do, uh, that we, except we do this sort of right before the Eucharist, um, right. where uh, uh, money is collected. Some of that goes to facilitate like paying the priests, and some of that actually goes to works of, of mercy. Um, so uh, namely the alms given to the poor as a testimony of our thankfulness unto God. And in this regard, also the infant fathers have called the sacrament an unbloody sacrifice. So you actually, again, you find that language as well in the patristics, that the sense in which Christ is offered as an unbloody sacrifice is that through his body, namely the church, the totus Christus, uh, we, through the, the, the distribution of the Eucharist, we are being made one functional body of Christ in our lives. Um, so continuing, and the table and altar, the ministers, priests, and the whole action, an oblation, not to God, but to the congregation, and not by the priest alone, it is by the priest, but it's not by the priest alone, but by the people. A canon of a certain council says, we decree that every Lord's day, and I'm actually not quite sure, maybe you could fill this in, Paul, I'm not quite sure uh, which council Perkins is quoting here, but we decree that every Lord's Day, the oblation of the altar be offered of every man and woman, both for bread and wine. So men and women bring sacrifices, they bring oblation, gifts, like donations, alms, um, during or before the Eucharist. Mm. Um, and Augustine says that women offer a sacrifice at the altar of God, that it may be offered by the priests to God. And usually okay. in the ancient writers, the communion of the whole body is called sacrifice or oblation. So <laughs> and he actually, he keeps going here. So like, uh, and, he, and then he says that the other sense in which it is a sacrifice uh, is that Christ is really present. Um, mm. So that uh, we, we really take the bread to be the body of Christ sacramentally by resemblance and no other. Uh, so th it's still bread. The bread and wine are still bread and wine. At, insofar as they are bread and wine, there's no change. Um, now, that's not to say there's no change, period, but it's that as we consider the bread and wine itself, the substance of bread and wine, that substance still remains. Uh, that's that's what Anglicans are affirm, affirming. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Perkins go on, goes on to speak of how Christ uh, is sacrificed in the Last Supper in regard of the faith of the communicants, which makes the thing past and done as present. So through faith. Uh, the Holy Spirit mysteriously is, it's actually, it's interestingly that some of the language of representation we would argue is actually a Protestant influence on modern Roman Catholicism. Interesting. Uh, but the Holy Spirit presents, it br he brings to the present the body and blood of Christ offered on the cross through faith, mm -hmm. not in the substance of bread and wine. Okay. So, so in all of those senses, we actually affirm it's a sacrament. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Very fascinating. Something, um, something that got me with this as well, like especially given how, like, obviously you can find diverse patristic opinion on virtually any topic, pick your poison really. Um, and so when arguments will come around of like, oh, well, Rome decrees this today. Oh, but look at that. These past fathers disagreed. And the usual response will be like, uh, look, the church hasn't fully fought out this issue yet. Um, so we can extend some grace and lenience to the past fathers. But now that the church has decreed this thing, um, it's settled, it's done. And so disobedience after the fact will not be excused. Um, the issue with apostolic curé is that as far as I've seen, it doesn't really put a limit of like, well, this was something instituted this time. 
Yeah. Um, and so those before, it's okay. But those after, no, you don't right. have an excuse. It, it from memory, it, it, it claims that this is like the ancient, the ancient custom right. of the of the of the whole church time and memoriam. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, actually, to find um, to find church fathers, like I, I guess they they do more hair splitting. Like, well, that was just his private text. It doesn't mean that that's what their ordinal said or whatever. But if you find church fathers, and even more significantly, perhaps ancient like ordination rites or what have you, that violate the standards that Pasolica curate, and that is a massive, massive problem. Um, if they uh, if they were to be uh, if they were to be consistent. Um, so yeah, I'll wait for Luke's got some Luke's got something happening. Okay, no, he's back. Well, Jay. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Now, before we look at early church sources, um, I, I want to yeah, and that's exactly what, right, Paul. And and the reason that's actually relevant is because this creates some tension actually during uh, the time of Apostolic Gregory itself among some of the Roman Catholic theologians uh, that made up the commission. Oh, oh interesting. Uh, so there's an article, I believe it's from New Black. Blackfriars, uh, called The Defect of Sacramental Intention, if you're looking for the source. Uh, now, I, I want to just show here uh, why this is this is not just two Anglicans uh, pointing out uh, some of the complexities here. So, for instance, there was a Jesuit uh, theologian named uh, uh, Father de Augustinus, which is, you know, Interesting. Um, it's a cool name, Father David Augustinus. Um, That's very cool. And he uh, he actually saw Anglican orders as valid. So he was on the commission. And oh. here's why. So he argues that errors about the purpose or effects of the sacrament is not incompatible with the true intention to confer a sacrament. And here's how he makes that argument. So if you think, so given that history, right, have that history in the back of your mind. Okay, so baptism. When a Baptist baptizes someone, and there are actually different Anglicans that will take different views on this. I, I have a pretty high view of baptismal regeneration, more of a Lutheran view. Um, other Anglicans don't, which is fine. Um, but we know Baptists, at least, at least some Baptists who have a very low view and think it's just a symbol, uh, which most Anglicans and Reformed would just deny. Uh, it's just, just a symbol. Uh, now, uh, among Baptists, Rome wants to say, oh, baptism really is conferred validly. So if you are baptized as a Baptist, you don't get rebaptized. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you become Roman Catholic, you get confirmed, um, you get you know, convalidated, et cetera, but you, but you don't get rebaptized. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, well, Baptist, uh, as this Jesuit theologian argues, um, he, they, even though they don't intend to affect what the church does they don't intend to affect salvation like mm -hmm. rome certainly intends to affect salvation by baptism uh they they are at least so the argument goes uh, intending somehow to do what the church does in baptizing someone now I, I don't know that that argument works but here's here's the problem rome does accept um baptist yeah. baptisms as valid yeah. Uh, so <laughs> the argument, at least, the fundamental argument, is that if Rome is going to say Baptist baptisms are valid, even though Baptists aren't intending to to affect what the church affects by baptism, mm. uh, well, then in this case of sacramental orders, where Anglicans are clearly, as we've just demonstrated, intending to ordain priests to offer the, the mass, the Eucharist, as a sacrifice, a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, but nevertheless a sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, well, then that error, quote unquote, if it was an error, seems much lesser than uh, the failure to intend to affect yeah. salvation through baptism if baptism yeah. really does save. So if you think that baptism saves, and a Baptist is doing that, but is doing that with a denial to the effect of baptism, yeah. Yeah. that's a much bigger quite, error. Quite explicitly of that, if you ask anybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And so this Jesuit theologian at the time uh, argued that they should probably accept Anglican orders as valid. Now, Bellarmine, similarly, he argues that about baptism um, uh, when he's thinking about the baptism of Anabaptists and so forth, and Protestants in general. Um, Louis, I, I don't know how quite to pronounce this, but Louis Duchesne, <laughs> Louis Duchesne, um, he, he's a French priest. He was part of the commission as well. 
Uh, he also believed in the validity of Anglican orders. Now, of course, there were priests on the commission that didn't, uh, but it yeah. but it was not settled. It, they they didn't come to an agreement. Um, okay, the Pope okay. took their reports, um, and his personal theologian actually wrote a commentary on it, and then the Pope made the the final decision there, oh, um, wow. in light of there being existing disagreement. So when Apostolic Akurai says, "Well, we, you know, we recruited people that disagreed disagree with each other, had di divergent views," what it doesn't say in that document is that those theologians did not come to a unified view mm. uh, by the end of their commission. Um, precisely for the reasons that we've just listed, that Anglican orders do seem to actually maintain an intent to ordain priests and bishops to offer the Eucharist as a sacrifice, a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving in which Christ is spiritually mediated and his yeah, body yeah. and blood is truly given through the Holy Spirit and through reception by faith, but nevertheless a sacrifice. Okay, that is, that is very fascinating. And really quickly before I continue to remind the people, that we will have a Q and A after this, and so particularly if you are either give a super chat or if you're a supporter on Subscribestar, you get priority with questions, and that will happen at the end here. So do remember that. Now, so yeah, fascinating. So to kind of re-raise what I brought up before, um, so so from seeing this, accepting Baptist baptisms, but then denying Anglican holy orders, I'm um, clear inconsistency there. Um, but then, um, the obvious, uh, the obvious issue then, then you need to ask, well, okay, what if we extend this down to the patristic period, you know, as I brought up before, um, and as a result, uh, and obviously I don't want to do that because then as a result, um, it's going to be absolutely hell on earth seeing who's got valid apostolic succession, who doesn't like just one bishop, just going back to like one bishop from the fourth century, who's ordained God knows how many other bishops, um, in, in other, in his own jurisdiction and, and maybe even others. Um, and then having to trace all that up and say, oh, look at that. This entire region of Western Europe, for example, is invalid because, because Bishop so-and-so didn't have the right intention in his, in his form. So that's, yep. that's really fascinating. Do, do you know any, um, do you, that in your reading of the documents on the commission, at least whatever you're able to get, did you find anyone who raised that concern? Interestingly, uh, Sapia Cip Sofikio does. Uh, okay. so they have the validity of the orders. Now, of course, in that res that 180-page response to Sapia Sofikio, um, they they try to uh, argue that well, in fact, the fathers did intend to uh, offer the mass up as a propitiatory sacrifice, and they pair that with this argument that well, and you know, you can tell because Cram that. Uh, the Tractarians are distorting history because, well, you know, Cranmer talks, uh, he bashes the notion of the mass, of the mass as a sacrifice. But okay. as we've just shown, Cranmer means something very specific by that language. Um, he bashes the mass as a sacrifice in the sense that Rome thinks it is. Because the, he doesn't dispute with the Anglican divines that say, here are the senses in which we say it, it's, a, a, it's a sacrifice. And Peter Martyr Vermigli actually also in his treatise on the Eucharist uh, mentions this as well. Okay. Okay, fascinating. Do you want me to bring up, uh, want to look at side piece of figure at all or back to Apostolic Akira or... Yeah, so I, I'm actually thinking like what, what you said earlier about why this creates problems actually transitions really quite nicely into looking at the patristic evidence. So if you want if you want to pull, pull up uh, Hippolytus's apostolic tradition, if you have access to it, yep. um, yeah, chapter seven, verses one through five. Now, to give a little bit of context while Paul's pulling that up, uh, the the uh, Hippolytus's apostolic tradition is at least claiming, um, it, 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 who knows, it might be, that might be a true claim, I just don't, I just don't know. Um, but it's claiming to convey the order for ordaining priests, bishops, and deacons, among other things, um, that the apostles passed on. Uh, now, uh, what we're going to find here is that in these documents, if Rome were to apply the criteria they use in Apostolic Akorai, to the this Hippolytus's apostolic tradition, you'd have to say there was a defect of form, and actually of intention. Uh, now, if Rome wants to say, well, you know, different words can signify like a good enough intention, it's like okay, fair enough. Well, then, then and I'll quote other patristics to, mm. to sort of elucidate what the intention was behind this. But right. if you're going to say that. Uh, then you can't invalidate uh, Anglican orders because of an alleged defect of uh, form. Right. So is this in, because um, from what I see in the document I have for it, there's a part one and a part two. Oh, uh, let's see. That's a good question. 
it's the ordination for a el quote unquote elder, but an ordination for a presbyter. Okay. Can you, can you read like the first few words yeah. in the sentence? So yep. I can word touch it? Yeah. So from the prayer, God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, look upon your servant here and impart the spirit of grace and the wisdom of presbyters that he may help and guide your people with a pure heart. Just as you looked upon your chosen I've people. It. Yep. I found it. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So, um, not even we can orders where, come on, where's this window somewhere buried here should be right here. There we go. So I'm going to have to blow that up a lot because yeah, no problem. HTML and project Gutenberg. Got a lot yeah, of no problem. All right. So just give me a little, all right, <clears throat> let's scroll down to where it was. Should be right. There we go. So this is the part you want to start at? Yep. Yep. Uh, now remember, this is the prayer uh, over which, uh, so a presbyter, they, they would have hands imposed on them, which we've also maintained, and interestingly, Presbyterians have maintained as well, um, with the laying on of hands. So hands are laid on a presbyter. And this is the prayer that's prayed over them as they're being ordained. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, look upon your servant here and impart the spirit of grace and the wisdom of presbyters that he may help and guide your people with a pure heart, just as you looked upon your chosen people and commanded Moses to choose elders, presbyters, uh, whom you have filled with your spirit, which you gave to your attendant. Now, Lord, unceasingly preserving us, uh, preserving in us the spirit of your grace, make us worthy so that being filled, we may minister to you in singleness of heart, praising you through your son, Christ, mm -hmm. Jesus, through whom uh, to you be glory and might, Father and Son with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, now and throughout the ages of ages. Amen. It's a beautiful prayer. I really it is, but there's a lot missing from it from the Roman view. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So and so here are some of the key key things that are missing, right? Allegedly missing. Uh, that uh, the explicit mention of even ordaining a priest for the office and work of a priest. That's not in this ordination, right? Um, the mm. mention, especially of, of ordaining a priest to offer this, the Eucharist as a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Okay, so then how might a Roman Catholic respond? Well, they might say, well, okay, but this is what these words intended to express that and given the development of doctrine, we can we can talk about ordin ordinals developing Slap over time. On it. Yeah, ordinals developing over time to express an intention. Okay, so then the claim would be, yeah, but this is intending to appoint priests to that work. Okay, now, fine, but if that's the argument you want to make, then one of the arguments from Apostolic Akurai falls to the ground, namely that uh, the Edwardine ordinal doesn't mention for the office and work of a priest, and therefore, you know, it has a defective form yeah. that disqualifies it. Yeah. Um, great. So then, are you? do you have anything you want to say on that, Paul, before we... Uh, we look at uh, oh really quick one more thing um mm -hmm. so we're we're going to also argue from the sources that now rome recognizes eastern order so we're also going to look at a yeah. few quotes yeah. from eastern rites to show Ooh, nice. if they were if the standard is consistent you have to say eastern orders are invalid but again the problem is that in orientalium ecclesiarum uh the uh, eastern orders were declared valid they were declared acceptable um, so you have a problem. If you're going to use these arguments against Anglicans, you'd have to reject Eastern orders, but you can't reject Eastern orders because Rome has already declared them valid. Okay. That is fascinating. Uh, I think I said my piece on, on this one, very fascinating how much is missing from it. But I think also the fascinating thing, um, the traditional authorship, Apostolica Curie is of course, a Hippolytus. Uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, of the, the, uh, Apostolic tradition. Yeah, of the apostolic tradition. Although there is the controversy, and I've seen decent arguments for it, that it may not have been by him specifically, yes. but some potentially a bit of a later composite work yep. and from different locations and that, um, yep. including um, including Egypt even potentially. Yep. So um, at least if we had traditional authorship, we'd be able to see, well, they didn't really uh, they didn't really have uh, decent ordination rights. That'd be kind of a problem because Apollos was kind of from Rome. He kind of would know this stuff. So that <laughs> kind of an issue for Rome's, uh, Rome's own apostolic succession. But it's even yep. made worse because, given that the evidence of a of a non of a non Hippolitan uh, authorship and from a different location and time, I think like fourth century I've heard or fifth century, um, then that creates that creates a decent problem because now we have this um, very much uh, less than valid ordination right 
Um, and we don't know where it was employed specifically. <laughs> so for all we know, there's some, there's some hidden non-valid bishops around there at us. So uh, it got a bit of a bit of an issue there for, for Rome. Yep. Yep. And it, you know, the problems as we dig into church history, the problems get somewhat more pronounced. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Paul, if you want to pull up uh, Irenaeus Book 4, Chapter 18. Oh, my man, Against Heresies, yeah. Book 4, Chapter 18. Chapter 18. And we're going to have to do a search here because I didn't write down the lines. No problem. No problem. I can do that. Um, so that's Chapter 12. When is it? Chapter 18. So it says concerning the sacrifices and oblations and those yeah. who truly offer them. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I've and, pulled it up from the legit, uh, I pulled it up from the legit Christian classics ethereal edition oh, of Shafe. Yeah. Because New Advent has at least one omission from the Shafe text, which is actually very, very <laughs> relevant. So I, I can talk about that later, but whatever. Yeah. Um, so I'll pull up the screen right uh, now. Should be right. Hang on. Be right, yeah. Opera tab, indication, blah, blah, blah. You're nice. Here we go. Okay, all good. Yep, great. And I'm starting from the, the sentence, and the class of oblations in general has not been set aside. The class of oblations, here we go. Okay, so that's paragraph two. Yep. Um, and the class of oblations in general has not been set aside. For there were both oblations uh, among the Jews, and there are oblations here among Christians. Sacrifices there were among the peoples. Sacrifices there are, too, in the church. But the species alone, interestingly, has been changed, inasmuch as the offering is now made not by slaves, but by freemen. For the Lord is ever one and the same. But the character of a so servile oblation is peculiar to itself, as is also that of the freemen in order that by the very oblations, the indication of liberty may be set forth, dot, dot, dot. And then I, I skipped down to uh, four at the beginning, God had respect to the gifts of Abel. Yep, right here. For at the beginning, God had respect to the gifts of Abel because he offered with single-mindedness and righteousness, but he had no respect unto the offering of Cain because his heart was divided with envy and malice which he cherished against his brother, as God says when reproving his hidden thoughts. Though you offer it rightly, yet if you do not divide rightly, have you not sinned? Be at rest, since God is not appeased by sacrifice. For if anyone shall endeavor to offer a sacrifice merely to outward appearance, unexceptionably, in due order and according to appointment, while in his soul he does not assign to his neighbor that fellowship uh, with him which is right and proper, nor is under the fear of God. He who thus cherishes secret sin does not deceive God by that sacrifice, which is offered correctly as to outward appearance, nor will such an oblation profit him anything, mm -hmm. but only the giving up of that evil, which has been conceived within him. So that sin may not more by means of hypocritical action, render him the destroyer of himself. Dot, dot, dot. Then starting from the Pharisees, had in themselves jealousy like to Cain. Therefore they slew the just one, slighting the counsel of the word, as did also Cain. For God Sorry, said, one, one second, where where did that skip ahead to? Uh, uh, they had. I think uh, I put in brackets the Pharisees. I think it said they had in himself in themselves jealousy. Had in themselves. Okay, got it. Yep. Yeah. Um. Uh. Now what else is to be at rest? Uh. Uh. Than to forego purposed violence. And saying similar things to these men, he declares, you blind Pharisees, cleanse that which is within the cup, uh, that outside may be clean also. Now, dot, dot, dot. Um, so I'm going to sacrifices, therefore. Okay. Sacrifices, Tama. there. Okay. Hang on. Um, sacrifices, there were among the people? No, that's that's before. Um, what's another... What's another for God stands in no need of sacrifice. For God stands in no need of sacrifice. Okay, got it. Right. Yep. Yeah, so for God stands in no need of sacrifice. And here's a key line, but it is the conscience of the offerer that sanctifies the sacrifice when it is pure and thus moves God to accept the offering as from a friend. Okay, so like just think about that line, right? It's the, the whether you think it's right or wrong, right? Whether you disagree with Irenaeus here. Um, he's saying that it's the conscience of the offerer that sanctifies the gift as holy. 
Okay, and then we keep reading. But the sinner, says he, who kills a calf to me, is as if he slew a dog. Inasmuch then as the church offers single-mindedness, her gift is justly ref, uh, reckoned a pure sacrifice with God. And here's another key line. As Paul also says to the Philippians, I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things that were sent from you, the odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, pleasing to God. For it behooves us to make an obligation to God and in all things to be found grateful to God our maker in a pure mind and in faith, okay, etc. Now, what did Irenaeus just compare the Eucharist to? He just compared it to Paul uh, calling their gift uh, the odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Clearly, uh, the Philippians were not giving a gift that was intended to be propitiatory. So if that's the case, Irenaeus is comparing the sacrifice being offered not to a propitiatory sacrifice, mm. but to a sacrifice that's being offered that does have a sweet smell to God, and that is a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Yeah, and it's yeah. an offer from those who are offering and or partaking yeah. in it themselves. Yep. Yeah. Which is why the Anglican understanding talks about the whole congregation, priest mm. and people being made into a sacrifice through the Eucharist. Fascinating. Okay, that is very fascinating. Oh dear. Okay, so um, uh, I think it's safe to say now that uh, Leon and perhaps even up to this day, the entirety of France has invalid uh, orders now. So um, yeah, who's our next victim? <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> is the next victim of Leo the Thirteenth. <laughs> City of God, uh, Augustine, uh, Book Ten, Chapter Six. Augustine, City of God. Yep. God, Book Ten, Chapter Six. There we go. Let's go to. Hang on. Because I did genuinely do not trust New Advent anymore, so I'm just going to go to Christian Classics Theorial. Yeah, um. Fair, yeah. um I like the Thomas Aquinas translation. It's pretty good. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, that says, let's move to. Uh, what's the title of the of the book of book ten? Um, that's a good question. Oh, okay. Um, let me let me count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Porphyry's doctrine of redemption. Oh, I've got a new advent. It's too hard now. Fine. I have to. I have to trust this site once. Oh, well. Um, okay, so book 10, chapter 6. Okay, ah, yes, I see what you're saying. Uh, if I can just zoom in a bit because my mouse wheel is going a bit nutso. Uh, all right, where's the window now? There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, what chapter was that? That was chapter seven, so let's move back here. Okay, here we go. Chapter six. Okay. Accordingly, when the apostle had exhorted us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, our reasonable service, and not to be conformed to the world. But sorry, sorry, really quickly. Did you did you start at the very beginning of the chapter or somewhere? Oh no, sorry about that. Uh though that 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 beginning is relevant. I sort of skipped that part uh, for time to accordingly when the apostle had exhorted us. But that is actually irrelevant. Thus, a true sacrifice is every work which is done that we may be to full God on together. But no problem. Okay, now I'm at the uh, yeah I'm at, I'm at uh, the yeah. There we go. Accordingly, what yeah. Accordingly, when the apostles had exhorted us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, our reasonable service, and not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we might uh, prove what is what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is to say, the true sacrifice of ourselves, he says, for I say through the grace of God, which is given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, accordingly as according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. And every one members one of another, having gifts differing according to grace that is given to us. This is the sacrifice of Christians. We being many are one in one body in Christ. This is also the sacrifice which the church, this is also the sacrifice which the church continually celebrates in the sacrament of the altar, which is known to the faithful 
in which she teaches that she herself is offered in the offering that she makes to God. Wow. So again, we, we, we do agree that the fathers talk about the Eucharist as a sacrifice, but the Anglicans, and I think these quotes are substantiating the Anglican view, have contended that the sense in which the Eucharist is a sacrifice is one of praise and thanksgiving, which the church offers to God, which unite us, uh, 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 make us one body and make the church herself an offering to God. So there's a spiritual communion uh, with Christ that happens uh, through the reception of his body and blood in the elements by faith that makes us an, a living offering uh, acceptable to God. Yeah. That's the sense in which we can see the fathers. We don't see the fathers in the first five centuries talking about the, the Eucharist as a propitiatory sacrifice. Okay, wow. So who who's up next or where to next? Yeah, so actually Augustine's uh, Epistle 62. Oh, Augustine Epistle 62. Now, now, and, and again, so I, and I really want to highlight that point. So neither Paul or I are denying that the Eucharist is a sacrifice, right? So Anglicans agree with that. Um, but that uh, the Eucharist is a particular kind of sacrifice. We argue a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving which makes us one and facilitates the church's unity so that we ourselves are made into uh, a living sacrifice acceptable to God. That's right. Yep. And I've got it. Uh, is this the correct one? Uh, let's see here. I have, I can't, so, so the, the words I have quoted here start with, for because Christ bore us all in that he also bore our sins. Uh, Okay, no, it's not in here. Interesting. Epistle 62. Maybe line, line 13. Uh, can you, or uh, paragraph 13? There's no paragraph. There's like uh, three paragraphs here total. Okay. I'll read that. I may, I may have gotten the the site, the, um, the quotation wrong. So I no can problem. read it. Or, or maybe a different collection numbering that, that happens to. Yeah. Yep. Um, for because Christ bore us all in that he also bore our sins, we see that in water is understood the people, but in wine is showed the blood of Christ. But when the water is mingled in the cup with the wine, the people is made one with Christ. And the assembly of believers is associated and conjoined with him on whom it believes. Which association and conjunction of water and wine is so mingled in the Lord's cup that the mixture cannot be uh, anymore be separated. Whence, moreover, nothing can, be, nothing can separate the church, that is, people establishing the church faithfully and firming, persevering in that which they have believed from Christ, in such a way as to prevent their undivided love from always abiding and adhering. Therefore, in consecrating the cup of the Lord, water alone cannot be offered. For if anyone offer the wine only, the blood of Christ is disassociated from us. But if the water be alone, the people are dissociated from Christ. By the way, again, whatever you think of this argument, us Anglicans do actually still mix water with wine, and actually so do a lot of Lutherans. Um, the people are uh, disassociated. Uh, they... And people are the people are joined with one another by a close union, and there is completed a spiritual and heavenly sacrament. Thus, the cup of the Lord is not indeed water alone, nor wine alone, unless each be mingled with each other, just as, on the other hand, the body of the Lord cannot be flour alone or water alone, unless both should be united and joined together and compacted in the mass of one bread, in which very sacrament our people are shown to be made one. So that in like manner, as many grains collected and ground and mixed together into one mass make one bread. So in Christ, who is the heavenly bread, we may know there is one body uh, with which our number is joined and united. So the focus, again, here is on the Eucharist as a sacrifice insofar as thanksgiving is offered up to God. And through communion with Christ, reception of his body and blood through faith, we are made into one unified body. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah. Very fascinating. Great. Uh, more, more invalid ordinations. How good. Yeah. <laughs> so the, um, the last, last quote I have here, uh, this comes from the apostolic, uh, I think the apostolic can constitutions. Um, and this is, uh, relative to the ordination of a priest as well. So another ordination right from the West. And I'll go ahead and just read this paragraph. Oh, yeah. Lord Almighty, our God, who has created all things by Christ, endossed in like manner, take care of the universe by him, 
For he who had the power to make different creatures hath also the power to take care of them according to their different natures. On which account, God, thou takest care of immortal beings by preservation alone, but of that that are mortal uh, by succession of the soul, by provision of laws of the body, by the supply of its wants. Uh, do thou thyself, therefore, even now look upon thy holy church and increase it, and multiply those that preside in it, and grant them power, that they may labor in word and deed for the edification of thy people. Do thou thyself also now look upon this servant who is put into the presbytery by the vote and determination of the whole clergy, and do thou replenish him with the spirit of grace and counsel to assist and govern thy people with a pure heart, in the same manner in which thou didst look upon thy chosen people, this command Moses to choose presbyters, uh, whom thou didst fill with thy spirit. And now, Lord, bestow and preserve in us the spirit of thy grace, that with that this person, being filled with the gifts of healing and the word of teaching, may in meekness instruct thy people and sincerely serve thee with a pure mind and willing soul, and may fully discharge the holy ministrations for uh, thy people through thy Christ, with whom be glory and worship and honor to them in the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. So, so look here, <laughs> like the um, the dual emphasis is on the authoritative preaching of the word and the holy ministrations of the sacraments. Cranmer's language echoes this really closely. Um, and that's pretty intentional on mm. Cranmer's part. So fascinating. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, I have one more piece and then unless you want to add anything, oh, and you. Go, go for it. summarize the argument and take stock of where this leads us. Okay. Yeah. So you, so, so you said you got one more thing or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the last thing <laughs> is uh, there's variance about this in medieval Roman Catholicism. Um, so a key quote here and variance in terms of there's no settled opinion on what the purpose of uh, offering up the mass is. There, there's no sort of unified stance on this yet. And I'll say why that's relevant in this sort of recapitulation, the summary of our argument here. Now, Peter Lombard in his sentences, uh, book four, chapter 12, I believe paragraph five, writes this. To this, we briefly reply that what is offered and consecrated by the priest is called a sacrifice and immolation because it is a memorial and representation of the true sacrifice and holy immolation made upon the altar of the cross. Christ died uh, upon the cross, and there he was immolated in his own self. And yet every day he is immolated sacramentally because there is a recalling of what was once done. Now, please don't mishear it or hear me. I am not saying that Lombard was a memorialist. He's, he wasn't. <laughs> um, so that's, I don't think he's saying that when he says uh, it's a, uh, uh, it's called a sacrifice because uh, it's a memorial and representation of the true sacrifice. But look what he does do. He's not saying that it's a, sac a sacrifice in the sense of being offered as a propitiation that accrues new merit. He's not saying that. He's saying the sense in which is a, it's a sacrifice is because it sacramentally embodies the once for all sacri uh, sacrifice made by Christ on the cross. And so as Anglicans, we do agree the true body and blood of Christ are given through the Eucharist, through the elements, by faith. And so in that sense, you are participating in the once for all sacrifice of Christ. But the elements are not called a sacrifice because the consecration of the elements is a propitiatory act which accrues merit. Lombard doesn't think that. Okay. Well, so uh, I guess the I guess the scholastic tradition to which uh, it owes its uh, its gratitude to Lombard, I guess that's been invalidated now. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. So, yeah. Anything you want to add, and then we can sort of take stock about where this leaves us. Right. Yeah. Right. Fascinating. Um, is there anything in particular you want to move um, move on to now um, on Apostolica Curie or the response or the response to the response? Or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, more. Um, yeah, I, I can say some things about uh, how these things are response. So, you know, I would encourage people to also read the response to yep. Sapiens Proficio. Like that's fair to do. Um, yep. It's it's a thorough response. Um, but I think I mentioned sort of this early on the central issue. Now, now the reason I skipped the historical issue. So those uh, who are curious, this is the this is the one here, a vindication yeah. of the Apostolic Curie. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So the reason I skipped the historical issue is again because that, that's interesting. But again, I just don't, you know, I, I don't think that's as important as the uh, 
as the theological issue. That theological issue is just more decisive by its nature. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I think that uh, the primary argument in that text is pointing out, well, look at all of these Anglican divines that said it's not a sacrifice. And when you situate Cranmer in the context of what what we've just quoted, um, mm. and you situate these other Anglican divines in that context, it's clear that they're denying that it's a sacrifice in the sense that Rome thinks it's a sacrifice, not that it's a sacrifice as such. Mm. Um, and this is going to be relevant in a second. Um, do you want to add anything to that, Paul? Uh, not particularly. You're pretty much saying everything. <laughs> it's pretty, okay. pretty good. Okay, great. So let's let's recapitulate the argument. Where does this leave us? Okay, so now it's true. One one could argue, right, that uh, well, okay, fine. But in the first five centuries, you're arguing from silence, and we don't know that it's not a propitiatory sacrifice. Okay, like fine. But first of all, I do think the the fact that that's not even mentioned shows that it's not present for the ecclesial consciousness of the first five centuries. But even so, right? Let's just let's grant that argument. Uh, that it's not at least a, uh, that you can't rule out that it's a, uh, a sacrifice from the lack of language. Okay, then Rome's going to have to drop an argument that it used in Apostolic Cora, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the arguments that was used against the Tractarians, and this is something I think actually the Tractarians got right, that um, just because the language isn't identical to the Roman language does not mean that... Um, the intention to offer the mass as a sacrifice was not present. Now, if Rome's going to say, well, that's a bad argument because the words were changed, right? The words don't match what Rome is today saying. They're going to have to discount all of those old ordinals, both in East and West, that also don't, that match the Anglican liturgy uh, and use the same phraseology. We just saw in the Apostolic Constitutions wording that's exceptionally close to what Cranmer had in his ordinal. Mm. Uh, so that's that's number one. But here's the more significant point. If Roman Catholics want to say that uh, it has to be a – okay, fine. Maybe you can say Anglicans had a view of the Mass as a kind of sacrifice, but it has to be a propitiatory sacrifice to be valid. Here's the problem. Eastern Orthodoxy does not consider the Mass to be a propitiatory sacrifice. They do consider it to be a sacrifice that mediates the forgiveness of sins, but they reject the whole system of merit. So you see this, for instance, there was a book that just came out, I think in 2021. Um, Paul, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it was just on, it was on the Eucharist in the East. Um, it, it came out a few years ago. And here's the thing, they're very, they're very clear at least. And if you go to like the OCA website or the Greek Orthodox Church website or whatever, you, you listen to theologians speak about the Eucharist, Alexander Shmemo. Uh, they're very keen on rejecting the, the framework of merit. Now that's that's a problem, right? Because if you reject the framework of merit, and if you say now that okay, well, for the mass to be a propitiatory sacrifice, that just means it conveys the forgiveness of sins, and that's why we we accept the Eastern orders. Guess what? Anglicans think that the Eucharist conveys the forgiveness of sins too. So do Lutherans. So on mm. that basis, you're going to actually have to say, well, you know, then okay, if I'm going to accept Eastern orders, then Anglican orders have uh, the mass as a sacrifice in the relevant sense, at least in the same sense that the East does. Now, if they're going to say, well, okay, but you know, the um, what it means to be a propitiatory sacrifice means somehow that uh, it brings some benefit to your soul that might avail you uh, in the intermediate state. Well, guess what? Even there, the East simply does not uh, simply does not agree, at least with the Roman Catholic framework of purgatory. They might agree, and some of them do, might agree of this sort of intermediate state where you go when you die, um, but they reject the system of merit in which your sufferings uh, are are sort of uh, making up for your temporal debt, where temporal debt is being satisfied the retributive punishment that's happening in purgatory. The East rejects that. That was a huge contention of debate uh, between both of them, no matter what they think about the intermediate state. So then they wouldn't have a legitimate Eucharist in that sense either. So here's the dilemma this puts Rome in. Uh, either they're going to have to reject Eastern orders for the same reasons that they reject Anglican orders, in which case the declaration of the validity of, of Eastern mm. order uh, is false which would falsify magisterial authority. 
or we'll have to backtrack on Anglican orders in order to accept Eastern orders, in which case Apostolica Cori is false. Either way, you have a magisterial contradiction. Fascinating. So we got a we got a pretty darn colossal uh, catch twenty two type situation here. Um, yeah, very very odd. And, and funnily enough, even um, it doesn't even like even that last point. It's um, it, it kind of the last point on how like look if you're going to say this against the Anglicans, you have to say it against the EOs as well. But you've also said that about the EOs too. So there's a total incompatibility. That point, you could even just say that one thing alone, and you wouldn't have to touch any of the other argumentation. Yeah. In Apostolic Cure, it'd pretty much be like the, the like you're going off the the wisdom of Sun Tzu and the art of war, like defeat your enemy before you even like before you without even laying a finger on him. So, so that's yeah. that, that's an interesting statement on top of the uh, good number of theological yeah. issues. Apostolic Cure. Yeah. So, and, yeah, and wow, you've, you've covered it pretty comprehensively. I don't really yeah. have much to comment on it other, apart from just like oofed. <laughs> Well, yeah, and you know, and even if one thinks the East is wrong to reject the whole system of merit, obviously, I think they're right in doing that. At least as Rome understands it. Uh, but even if one thinks they're wrong in doing that, uh, Rome has still pronounced their orders valid. So apparently, conceiving mm. of the Eucharist as a sacrifice in that context is not necessary. Um, plus, right. also recapitulate the same grounds upon which Rome accepts the sacrament of baptism. Uh, it seems to me, given that the mm, sacrificial right. intention of the priesthood is still there, as we've just shown, um, that they they have to, if they're being consistent, yep. accept the validity of Anglican orders. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, anything more to say, or do you want to move on to Q and A? Yeah, let's let's move on to Q and A. Too easy. Too easy. Um, so, anyone, drop in your questions. It is Q and A time. Remember, priority for super chats. And for supporters on Subscribestar. So let us begin. This doesn't seem to be a question, but we have a small super chat from John Smoth. Thank you very much for that. Blessed Ascension Eve, gentlemen. Likewise to you, good sir. And um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'm not seeing right now any questions from support. Uh, whoops, from supporters at the moment. Scrolling up. Um, nope, I don't see anything yet. So first question will be from Pog Warriors. Does this change with invalid ordinations in the Church of England and the American Episcopal Church regarding women yes. that think they are bishops? Yeah, good, good, good question. So different Anglicans will take different stances on this. Personally, um, I, I just don't see how female ordinations to the priesthood or to the episcopate are valid which means that the ordinations they do are invalid. Now that said, there are plenty of dioceses with legitimate lines that haven't gone that way. Even, even actually a few egalitarian dioceses that still have that, where the bishop is male. So even if the bishop does an invalid ordination of a yeah. woman presbyter, um, they ordain other male presbyters yeah, and then yeah. those males become bishops or whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but that said, personally, uh, and again, this is, this is not the stance I do think this should be the stance, but um, I I do not see how it's theologically consistent to regard uh, women ordination to the priesthood or to the episcopate as valid. Right. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, Trivery asks, what's the name of the Catholic document that says Eastern orders are valid and where yeah. can I read it? Yeah, good question. Let me pull it up here. Um, I Let's see. I believe it is, sorry, I'm trying to, I kind of wrote all of this in obsidian and didn't no problem. categorize it, um, which by the way, is an excellent note-taking app. Uh, what, what app do you use? Uh, obsidian. Oh, perfect. I use that as well. Oh, hey, no way. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually using it to basically make it like a comprehensive knowledge library like i categorize all my books and articles whatever i read slow going but i'll do it and then i put tags in it put down notes in it and cool quotes in that so just like everything i note down in it from like across historical sources it's just there type in a tag get everything i need done <laughs> yeah yep yep and it kind of generates a um a mind map which is really I've seen that map. too yeah um, <laughs> mine's too messy to be of any use but yeah <laughs> yeah um, let's see here. 
Give me just a second to find that dot. Not a problem. Not a problem. I think in the meantime, I can... Oh, thank you very much for that super chat, Pog Warriors. You're an absolute legend. Absolutely legendary. Um, so while you're getting that for Triver, we can an... I, I can answer Matt Schneider. Oh, just got it. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. What's it called? It's called uh, Orientalium Ecclesiarum. Orientalium Ecclesiarum. Okay. Excellent. There you go, Trivery. You can go and uh, look that up and read it. Very fascinating stuff. Um, now, I, uh, there is uh, Matt Schneider says, doesn't Saint, uh, Justin Martyr say that the Eucharist is a sacrifice of Thanksgiving? I think in the first apology, I'm late to the stream. Sorry if yeah. it was already addressed. I, th I yeah. think he brought it up once, but um, it is. Yeah. It's in chapter 66, I believe. I can, uh, yeah. if, if, he, if he wants for his convenience, I can read that right now. Yeah. I've got it. I've got it over here. I believe it's chapter 66. Um, but in either case, oh crap, that just went down a lot. Um, da, 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 hate when it does that. All right. Of the Eucharist. And this food is called among us, uh, Eucharistia. That's my pronunciation system. The Eucharist, of which no one is allowed to partake, but the man who believes that the things which we teach are true and who has been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sins and unto regeneration and who is so living as Christ is enjoined. For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ, our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise have we been taught that the food which is blessed with the prayer of his word and from which our blood and flesh may, by transmutation are nourished uh, is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. For the apostles in the memoirs, uh, in the memoirs that compose which are called gospels, have thus delivered unto us uh, what was enjoined upon them that Jesus took bread, and when he said, and he had given thanks, said, This do this in remembrance of me, this is my body, and after that same manner, having taken the cup, this is my blood, and gave it to them. Um, I actually no, I don't think this is the one. There's a no, no, there's another quote elsewhere where he does more explicitly speak of Thanksgiving language, but you can easily you can easily find it within a with, with an internet search. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, and I, I didn't <laughs> I scattered some of these notes in the last two hours of no, no problem. All right. But yeah, so unfortunately I don't have one. Um, an interesting point that I just want to also raise about Eastern orders um, or Eastern and Anglican relationships, it's telling to my mind that in the 1920s, uh, the, Const the Patriarch of Constantinople actually declared Anglican orders valid, which is really interesting. Now, now then there were actually talks in the 70s of being in full communion. What broke down uh, talks between the East and Anglicanism uh, was the ordination of women to the Episcopate and the Episcopal yeah. Church. Um, that that collapse, which is really a shame and unfortunate, and I wish that didn't happen. And I get it from the East side because I don't like that that happened either. Um, but uh, there it is in the 1920s at least. So certainly uh, sometime a few decades after the publication of Apostolic Cora, the Patriarch of Constantinople evidently explicitly rejected uh, the Bishop of Rome's judgment there. Right, right. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, this next one, next question is, Sean, I've been really enjoying your content recently. Great stuff. Thanks, brother. I, I appreciate it. Um, Rome has always treated Eastern Orthodox ordinations as valid ab initio. Um, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so our, our argument is that, yeah, and the arguments, it, the same basis by which they've done that, if they're being consistent, should lead them to accept the validity of Anglican orders, in which case magisterial infallibility is false mm -hmm. because of what they declared in Apostolic Cacori. Right, right. From Athanasius, does the Didache re uh, reject the real presence in the Eucharist? No, no, and, and neither do we. Like so, so here's here's part of the problem with that phrase, "real presence," right? Um, it's really vague. We would argue that Lutherans hold to real presence. I'm sure most of us would argue that the East holds to the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, of His body and blood truly given in the elements. So do we. Uh, that you know that that doesn't really speak to the way in which christ is present in the eucharist and on that there are a variety of different views but in any case the mode of his presence in the eucharist wasn't really the precise issue anyway at apostolic kakura it's tangentially related like you can make an argument that well a eucharistic sacrifice applies transubstantiation or something like that but then that again becomes a problem when you're thinking about eastern orders right right makes sense 
Do you think it's relevant to the discussion that some early fathers seem to think the Eucharist as medicine, Ignatius and Irenaeus' yep. examples? I do, yeah. So Cran um, Perkins, I think. Um, William Perkins, and there's, and I think even Richard Hooker uh, talk about the Eucharist as medicine as well, um, following that line of reasoning. Um, so yes, I do think like this notion of the Eucharist as a medicine of immortality is sort of the, and the East actually still, that's more of their favored language because they, they seem to favor more medicinal views of the atonement anyway. Um, so that, that's more of their privileged language anyway. Anglicans fully accept that uh, as well. We, of course now, you know, our disagreement between West and East in general is, I think those of us on the West rightly think that the East over dichotomize some of these things, but, um, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of the atonement, at least. Uh, but uh, yeah, I do think it's significant that that's yeah. the dominant motif and not propitiation, especially not propitiation within the system of merit that Rome has. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I don't see any other questions here. So assuming that remains the case, uh, Sean, would you like to plug your stuff? Yes, sure. Yeah, so my channel is Anglican Aesthetics. Um, you'll see more content coming out. As the, the name suggests, my main interest, interestingly, are theology of beauty. Uh, part of what led me into sort of ecumenical dialogue is uh, this desire for the beauty of the church manifest in the unity of the church. As we sort of unpacked these quotes, um, there's this huge emphasis on the Eucharist facilitating unity uh, between in the body of Christ and in Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, uh, there's an emphasis on discerning the body of Christ, discerning the unity of Christ's body in the elements. And so uh, that's very much on my heart. So you'll see material come out that continues ecumenical dialogue, uh, as well as engaging uh, more recent uh, biblical studies materials by certain atheists, um, mm -hmm. as well as um, fleshing out eventually a theology of beauty, which is sort of my primary interest that's great stuff and that that's kind of aligning with something i'm about to be angling into myself because i want to start making some material um really reaching out to uh, other reformed evangelical anglicans to make an apologetic for why liturgy is a good and proper yeah. form superior yeah. form of worship over what we currently uh, so. very often have um yeah. so yeah we definitely definitely have some common interest in that on that issue um yeah. but, oh hang on we're about to go we've got one more from athanasius you're not about to go apology Anglicana on us, are you? <laughs> what does that mean? I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> you know the story? You know Jacob Watson, apology Anglicana? No. Okay. He, he, well, that was his, um, well, he took that site. He took that site from Christian Wagner. Um, I th uh, think, yes, yes. He kind of took that over from Christian Wagner, if I'm not mistaken, um, when he became Roman Catholic. Um, but Jacob Watson recently became Western Rite Orthodox. So. Uh, oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Wow. Nope. Not even close. I, so I have my own gripes with the Orthodox, which for a different day, um, I, I'd get into. But. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Sean. This was good. Um, very, uh, very, ang uh, very, uh, shall we say, informative. Um, even for me as well, um, having only been like yeah, a pretty bit of a novice on this on this specific issue, even though I've read uh, read material, relevant material on it, um, but certainly helpful and uh, certainly does seem to expose a pretty serious serious problem that uh, that from the looks of it, Rome has created for herself with this uh, fateful decision by Leo the Thirteenth. So thank you so much for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, Paul. Yeah, I really appreciated this. Not a problem. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Sean Luke of Anglican Aesthetics, and this has been The Other Paul. I hope you have a lovely day or evening. God bless.